So thanks again for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here, contribute to your seminar series. Um, as was indicated in the introduction, I'm the regional representative of Il or ILWI, the International Livestock Research Institute. Um, but I'm not today going to talk about livestock very much at all. Um, you see the topic, which is about enabling outcomes from agricultural research. Uh, this is a topic I selected based on some discussions with Circa in recent weeks about what areas of mutual interest were. And this seemed to be an area of interest that I like to explore more with Circa. And it's, a, it's an area of work that Ilri has now quite a few years of experience in. So hopefully there's some kind of joint sharing of ideas and things that we could, we could uh, get from this. Um, so the outline of my presentation, I'm going to talk about impact pathways, innovation systems, innovation platforms, and scaling up innovation platforms. Now I should just pause a minute to say that I'm sure that many of you are very familiar with many of these concepts and these approaches, so you'll forgive me if this seems like it's stuff that you already know, but I'm hoping maybe there will be some new things here. Um, so when, I mean, it was mentioned that it was part of the CJR, and the CJR, we think of global research contributing in five different ways. Um, basically, primary research, research you might do in a lab or a field station. More applied strategic research you might do with um, some other partners. And then there's some stages of playing a cat catalytical role to try to get your research to have some sort of effect, facilitating, enabling that, and then even playing a role in ad advocacy. But in this kind of research process, how do you actually have impact among, for example, smaller farmers that you, you're trying to address? And if we think about kind of a, a traditional log frame approach to getting things done, you know, often if you look at a log frame, you'll have some objectives and so on, and there'll be some research activities and outputs associated with those. But then we just assume that things happen, then there's impact. If you do these activities, then things will happen. And basically, there's something missing in the middle of here. And so what this kind of approach, we talk about an out, out, you know, from the impact pathway approach, is to kind of fix the missing middle, and to recognize the importance of actors and decision makers to actually do something with the research outputs and do things differently. They should change their behavior, and only then are you going to have impact. So just some definitions in this sort of terminology, and this may be familiar with everybody. So research outputs are just deliverables. You know, it's kind of knowledge products, science, it can be a form of a report, paper, some kind of a manual, new tools, new strategies. But the key part here is, is outcomes. And when we talk about outcomes in this sort of terminology, what we're referring to are actual changes in practices and capacity. So whether it's producers, researchers, market actors, or even policy makers, they use the learnings from the outputs and they, and they do things differently. So the key thing about an outcome is a behavioral change. Somebody who something different. And then impacts. I mean, sometimes people talk about impacts and say, well, you know, we had an impact because we increased the amount of uh, fluid that was sold in the market. Well, in this strict definition, that wouldn't really be an impact. It would be an impact if increasing that sale actually led to improvement in somebody's income or somebody's nutrition. So it's actually what, how people's lives are changed through increased income, better health. So so rather than the traditional, the traditional um, kind of straight line, though, we want to think about how these kind of things interact in terms of outcomes, outcomes, 
in outputs that are mentioned and impacts on scaling up. And I think many of us researchers, we've been criticized over the years because our traditional approach to delivering agricultural research outputs has been very, you know, what people call supply driven, just kind of pushing them. And it's like, okay, here's the, the output, do something with it. We expect somebody else to kind of take it up. We've all kind of heard this sort of criticism. And part of the, the conventional approach has been Um, so here we have researchers and we work with extension agents and say, okay, we produce this learning, here we package it for you, now take it to the farmer. Now, one of the things that we want to recognize is the farmer's making decisions based on a lot of other things too, because the farmer actually is influenced by markets, um, other farmer groups, consumers, farmer is part of a system. And this kind of approach has sometimes, because it's not recognizing these other factors, may not successfully kind of yield results. So if we think of an innovation systems approach, what we're trying to do is recognize all these different kind of actors, these different players, where you may have, so you may have farmers, but you've got traders, you've got people at different stages of the value chain who are kind of participating. How do we kind of bring research outputs and do research in such a way that we take into account those other factors? So an innovation systems approach tries to sort of get inside this process, not just kind of be on the outside and delivering research outputs, right? So we got research and extension trying to interact with these different actors. But Okay, it looks good, you can put it on a diagram, but how do you go about actually achieving these implementations? And then, so if we think about changing through innovation and also participa participation, you can think of so this progression of somebody kind of trying to push a technology and thinks about, okay, what's a better way to do this? One is to join up with others and then innovate, add other components, and then they work. So the key is facilitating innovation, but also group action, multiple um, actors. So I'm going to introduce the concept of an innovation platform. And all of us will be familiar with different types of participatory research and extension kind of approaches. This is one of them. This is one which is, it's quite, um, it's a, quite a bit of interest now to a lot of research projects. Um, and it's, it's kind of being streamlined and you know, made more systematic. So an innovation platform is simply defined as a space for learning and change. A group of individuals, who often represent others with different backgrounds and interests, farmers, traders, food processors, researchers, government officials. So the key issue here is you have different perspectives and points of view being represented, which would be different, for example, if you just had a group of farmers, a self-help group or a collective or something. The idea here is to bring people with different interests and different perspectives together for joint learning. So to kind of put that in a diagram, the innovation platform is kind of here in the middle. You have farmers represented, you have researchers, you might have private sector, government officials, other members of the community. The key thing is that you need those multiple perspectives because they all may have some stake in the type of change that you're trying to facilitate. And if their point of view is not incorporated, you may have difficulty bringing that change around. So why innovation platforms? Um, these processes can be enhanced by creating more possibilities for actors to interact. The better coordination, 
to push for complementary and integrated strategies, approaches, sharing and learning, how can we do things better. Um, but also, you may want to kind of change the institutions and the policies, create change to the kind of the networks and the way that some of these actors actually associate with each other. So what would kind of an implementation of an innovation platform look like? Um, if you kind of have time to go in this direction from top to bottom, Most of it may start out being project driven. Um, but as you go on, it would be more stakeholder driven. And you would go through, this is just to represent an iterative process of establishing kind of what the, this innovation platform is about. What are people's interests? What are the roles, the objectives, and responsibilities? Um, and then think about activities and outputs that the group might do together. But, and I'll talk a bit more about monitoring and evaluation later, but you know, to be sure that you're actually achieving something, you have to have some kind of way of monitoring and evaluating. Um, so over time, you may have iteration of kind of joint activities, gatherings to think about what you've achieved. So a typical innovation platform cycle might be starting with some idea, okay, here's some life stuff. Here. We've, this has been applied to quite a few of uh, some good projects, for example. You might initiate a platform, decide what the focus is, and then go through some iter iterative steps where you're identifying options, like options to improve the system. And the key thing here is you're trying to bring together science in the way that many of us think of science, in terms of formal science and researcher science, but also bringing indigenous knowledge and so on together. So you're using those different sources of knowledge to identify options, uh, to test and refine solutions, uh, to develop capacity to, to continue those, um, and then you get to implement, scale up, and then at the same time you're analyzing, you're learning from this process and going back to do you change what you're doing at this moment. And some examples there have been good innovation platforms in India. This has been applied to kind of natural resource management, like in Ethiopia, people try to kind of better manage the soils and water, um, vegetable producers, dairy producers. So, but typically there was kind of one area of focus that the group all comes together around. Um, and the, so the impact pathway then for an innovation platform would be this improved communication and coordination. Through these kind of iterative activities, you have changes in knowledge, attitude, capacity, and practices. Um, improve productivity, improve benefits, and then you know your impacts on income, poverty, and security. One thing just to point out is that this this kind of a grouping doesn't should not necessarily replace kind of existing groups where you may have self help groups, you may have cooperatives or collectives, which are more kind of homogenous groups doing some particular activities. The idea of this is to try to get a kind of a different group that brings in other actors which may not be part of your cooperative and so on, and to, to enable learning through these interactions with others. So you see kind of these two channels because the innovation platform might be quite different from whatever farmer group you have. Because it, I mean, typically the innovation platform is not going to be just farmers, it needs to have other players. So this kind of interaction is important for uh, achieving that kind of argument. And just to mention, some of the innovation platforms are really focused on kind of helping producers improve productivity, but some are focused more on markets. Uh, so market-driven innovation platforms, and these, these uh, rely 
significantly on bringing together producers but also traders um, and getting them together and what is it because a trader in the case of goats in some systems they may not be able to find enough goats enough supply at the same time a farmer don't know where to sell them and also don't know how to take care of them properly so you try to learn together in terms of both increasing productivity and having a good market um, and the key here is that is recognizing um, the importance of the market actors in the innovation platform process um, and not expecting necessarily that farmer groups are going to take over all the marketing function because sometimes it's too easy to have a, a sort of a cooperative or collective decide okay we're going to, we're going to do every step of the value chain we're going to organize ourselves to sell the products. We can process them ourselves and so on. And not recognizing that there are specialist people who have been doing some of this stuff for generations. They have all the networks and so on. And rather than trying to kind of replace them, find ways to, to work together and find new kind of mechanisms and arrangements. Um, so this is, and these have been some of the more successful innovation platforms or the ones that are really built around the markets because they tend to build linkages where those linkages were kind of very informal and sometimes those linkages are very suspicious. You know, farmers can be sometimes suspicious of traders and also officials may be suspicious of some of those market items. Um, so as the literature on innovation platforms is, is quite developed now, and so some of the principles really to stimulate learning innovation have to do with being inclusive, being participatory, important to find a common vision so that you don't have a group that are kind of loosely aligned and operating on different expectations, having an agreed set of modalities. Um, they need some incentives to participate. The farmers really, or the other actors, don't really feel like they're going to get much out of it. Um, they're not going to participate. And we found this sometimes in the case of uh, market agents. It's hard in some cases to find incentives for them to participate. Diversity of members, capacity, and this is again this point I was kind of emphasizing. This is not a homogenous group of just producers or just uh, market actors. The diversity is the critical part. Um, there's good communication, there's joint identification of challenges and opportunities, and an important part of it is learning and doing by monitoring and evaluation. So the, the whole iterative learning process is critical. So it's a dynamic process because as things are learned over time, um, you may have a changing focus of the group. You may have changing membership as things develop and, and uh, we test Kind of new strategies you realize well you know we didn't bring in the seed suppliers or we didn't bring in the officials who control some part of the market so you may change the membership of the group to make sure that you've got kind of all the interests represented um, changing responsibilities as things evolve and then the other thing to emphasize is these are not necessarily meant to be long-term groups these are not meant to turn into, you know, self-sustaining, 10, 20 year long organizations. These are catalytic, facilitative things. And because the long-term groups are more likely to be cooperatives or other forms, which have a much more kind of official registration and status and so on. But these are meant to just sort of facilitate those kind of groups to, to innovate. And again, just to sort of highlight some of those critical features of um, what an innovation platform means as a common objective, common vision. It usually doesn't happen naturally, so it needs some kind of facilitation process to do some visioning, kind of foresight, to think about, okay, what is it that is of interest and that is achievable? Um, in the context of researchers, like us, um, it's made important that the research questions are relevant, to give participants to articulate their demands. 
uh, because the questions are often hidden kind of in multi-stakeholder negotiation processes. Some of this, for example, where you have sort of different competing interests between stakeholders and you may need to figure out, okay, what's the question that's going to be able to resolve some of those. Um, and of course, you use participatory methods. And then the idea that knowledge is co-created or kind of jointly developed, that it's not sort of a researcher sitting there doing the learning when everyone else is just helping kind of like, you know, organize the trial and so And it builds on the idea that innovations do not originate from, you know, formal science alone, but from multiple sources, including indigenous knowledge. And so these platforms offer opportunities for knowledge co-creation by researchers, other stakeholders. So the benefits of such innovation platforms could be to facilitate dialogue and understanding, enable partners to identify the bottlenecks hindering innovation, lead to better informed decisions through joint learning. Um, and then and a key part of this, which I haven't mentioned very much, is, is there's this notion of innovation capacity. And what you're trying to do is develop capacity among groups that they can then take on, and they will learn through the process that, okay, in future, we need to operate in a different way. We need to network and engage differently with more players to really kind of achieve our aims. Even if we are, you know, a homogenous and a producer group, they may learn to operate differently to get what they need through this kind of dialogue process. And of course, the, the the ultimate benefits that we're looking for are changes in practices that increase productivity, incomes, livelihood assets, and income. Um, I mean, this all sounds, you know, kind of good, ideal, but there are some real constraints to implementing these types of approaches. Um, the progress and success depends on the buy-in of the members. Um, tangible outputs are needed to s sustain interest and commitment. People need to really see something that comes out of it, otherwise, you know, spending time in meetings and so on. It can be difficult and costly to implement. You may need to offer transport costs or there's a cost of people's time. And also, from the researcher point of view, if you're initiating something like this, the facilitation time required can be enormous investment. Uh, requires a long-term perspective, and it can be difficult to monitor and evaluate in a systematic way because some of the benefits are not so tangible. They're more in, in the form of kind of joint learning, new thinking, and how do you kind of evaluate and monitor these benefits. So, to get to monitoring and evaluation, I mean, there's still questions as to innovation platforms' contributions to effective research for development and outcomes. So that work was still looking and trying to demonstrate that more clearly. Um, because innovation processes are complex, you cannot plan them all right from the beginning. Um, sometimes things happen that are largely unintended, so it's difficult to measure them. Um, there are an interplay of many factors, which makes it difficult to attribute changes to specific cause, but these challenges should not stop us from attempting to capture, you know, to measure at least the level of effectiveness that may be there. So what to monitor activities that aim to resolve the problem or take advantage of an opportunity, process outputs, um, including changes in knowledge, attitudes, practices of platform members, these are really outcomes. And there's ways to kind of measure outcomes. When people start to behave differently, or they, they express their kind of views that they believe now in different sort of approaches and so on, then you see that as some kind of an outcome. And then you would also want to monitor actual impacts on whether. And there are a number of tools that you can use to assist in this kind of monitoring. And some of these will be familiar to anybody who's been working in kind of participatory research and um, Outcome mapping is a tool that Canadian IDRC developed. Um, there is a 
things called most significant change analysis, network analysis, participatory impact analysis, um, digital storytelling, participatory video, or something which is quite interesting, a lot of people know. Uh, but then you can also get into a more kind of systematic and quantitative um, M&E as well in terms of surveys and changes in actor behavior. Are they actually, are farmers actually doing anything differently? If so, can you do a quantitative analysis of changes in income productivity? So these are just some of the sets of tools, some qualitative, quantitative that you could use in kind of monitoring. Okay, but the issue is, you know, the way I've kind of described it, you may picture it as kind of a few sets of actors. You might have one group in this district, you know, an innovation platform with 12 or 14 members and another in another, another district, but how are you going to achieve anything bigger than just working with a few groups? And this has been something that's been a challenge too, a lot of thinking is going into how do we expand and scale up innovation and impact at wider levels, even nationally. And things that you may want to scale up are, you know, it's the approach itself, it's the principle and methods of stimulating local innovation processes. So for example, if you're working with um, you know, government development, ministry officials, and if they're participating in this, they learn some of these approaches, and then they replicate it in other places, and you don't have the researchers having to kind of lead the process, that's one means of kind of scaling up. And so you want those kind of lessons in building multi-stakeholder partnerships to create enabling conditions. You know, those enabling conditions may mean um, local governments, local agencies providing resources or facilitating these types of activities because they learn that, okay, this offers some opportunities for it. And then there may be cases where actual new practices and new organizational market approaches can be scaled up. So for example, in some of these growth projects, through the innovation platform, we found new ways of, of kind of weighing animals and treating animals as a group. And these are you know, practical kind of learnings that can then be directly replicated and scaled up. So part of it is scaling up the process, and part of it is scaling up the actual output. So, Uh, yeah, I think these are the same. So, and there are some cases of, um, of kind of different levels of innovation platforms, or R4D platforms, where you have, you know, something, you may have local levels, where you may have them in certain districts, um, and then you may decide at a region to have members from those, and then even, you may even consider it a national level. And the idea being that the learnings that are coming, you want learnings to sort of go both ways, and that, you know, if there's some particularly interesting learning that emerges from one or two innovation platforms in one area, that you find some way to be able to kind of convey that, that kind of information to other parts of it, so that it's, you know, it becomes more than just kind of an aggregation. So, um, innovation platforms is a promising model. There's a lot of people now in Africa and Asia who are uh, investing a lot of energy in these types of approaches to stimulate innovation and learning. But it's resource intensive. It requires careful assessment of adjustment to the local kind of context. And impact still needs to be conclusively demonstrated on the other hand, um, the alternative options for improving research outcomes, there are there, but um, they're still limited. And, and there's a lot of examples that over the years people have tried, whether it's farmer field schools or other types of approaches. And in many cases, some of these have had you know, some limitations. So this is an attempt to, OK, can we try something that sort of uh, uses an innovation system 
start to, to more effectively reach out. So I'll end there, but with my last slide, I just want to give you, so as I mentioned in the beginning, Hillary has done a lot of work on innovation platforms. Um, and if you just go to, so there's these 12 briefs. They're quite short. They're just like four or five pages long. And they kind of provide information on the, all the different steps and issues around innovation platforms. How do you set them up? How do you facilitate them? How do you monitor them? Um, and if you just search on CG space and innovation platforms, you'll find these, uh, these guides. And I want to acknowledge most of what I presented come from these three people and others um, who are some of the gurus uh, that we've been working with in the vision platform. So I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Star, for that very interesting presentation. Uh, the floor is now open for your questions, insights, and comments. Kindly use the microphones along the aisle, and please identify yourself and your organization to represent. First question, yes. Yes, Burgos from Syria. Thank you, Dr. Steve. Um, in Hillary's experience, what organization or interest groups would be in the best position to lead or facilitate uh, innovation platforms? For instance, for livestock or governments? Yeah, that's, a, that's an important question, and I didn't really touch on that issue. I mean, we so our experience has been one, either you working with local researchers to kind of lead the, the process or working with local like NGOs, development organizations. Um, I think generally at the beginning we've had better luck working with, with local researchers because the researchers were able to sort of, you know, really kind of absorb all these kind of concepts and kind of and implement them. Whereas with some of the NGOs, they tended to be like, you know, we've been doing participatory stuff for years. We just kind of meet with the farmers and we have our ways of going about it. And sometimes they're less willing to kind of try something new. Um, well, the same thing with the researchers. Sometimes we had to kind of, you know, um, introduce them to these. Um, so, I mean, one interest. For us as international researchers, it would be really great at national level to develop capacity of organizations to lead all this type of work. Um, and um, like Sierra, for example, you know, it would be really interesting. Um, I'm sure there's quite a bit of this, this going on, but just to sort of have sort of some, some centers of excellence who can kind of develop capacity among national organizations to kind of facilitate and scale up this kind of Other questions, yes. Thank you, Marcel Gardis of Silica. To what extent has a CGIR um, implemented or facilitated or Apply uh, this idea of innovation platforms in your in, this, in projects. Um, I mean, it, it's sort of accelerating now. It's, a lot of this work started maybe around ten years ago, um, but it was kind of bits and pieces here and there. Certain CG centers, um, Hillary, Getfree, a few others. But then in the last four or five years, it's gotten quite a bit more attention to it. Um, in particular, you know, the, the CG now is organized in these CRPs, these CGIR research programs. And some of them have these kind of platforms as their core model. It's their core kind of R4D model. Um, so, I mean, this is one reason that I think it's important to bring it to wider attention is because 
And I think the CG is investing quite a lot in these. And the more capacity and interest there is among other partners to you know, participate in that, I think the more effective the CG is going to be doing these things, because the CG tries to do these on their own.
and national development part. And so the way we tried to get it work is that the development agencies did the actual facilitation and organization of those things. And the research partners assisted kind of in particularly the M and E, but it also in making sure that, you know, the different sort of science was was you know kind of being included and so on. So I was trying to you know differentiate a little bit the role of researchers because as you say, when researchers get into just trying to do development projects, you know, chances are they're they're not going to be very successful. So try to find a way that you can have development agencies actually lead the development part of it and make sure that researchers are involved to sort of help with the knowledge generation. Any more questions? Dr. Stahl, you mentioned that uh, innovation platform is cost uh, intensive, or it, it will take a lot of investment to implement. So how do you seek to, to address such challenge in cost, um, costly to implement? Well, I think part of the challenge is in the in the M and E part of the learning is to really better identify, you know, what what is really necessary to get them to work and to facilitate. You know, do what's the level of effort that you really need, or can you reduce the level of effort? Can you capacitate um, local partners to kind of lead more? Because you see right now, too often, these types of platforms are being, you know, are being facilitated by like high level researchers who come with a lot of costs and all those things. And so, you know, can you develop a model where kind of others are capacitated to be able to scale it up and out? But I think, you know, that lesson, the, the cost effectiveness of these types of approaches is still not really good demonstrated is it's still kind of in the process. And, and this, I mentioned, there's quite a bit more investment by the CT now in these such approaches. And I'm hoping that part of that will be learning, is it cost effective? How can you make it more cost effective in such a way that you can scale it up without just huge transactions? 